I think I can sum up the show for you with one word. Nothing. It was always inevitable that my ongoing Day X Was Born series would eventually lead to Seinfeld. I mean, it's impossible to tell the history of American television and even global television and culture without mentioning the groundbreaking sitcom. In my very first video for the series The Day Parks and Recreation Was Born, I talked about how the series had a rocky first season before it eventually found its creative footing and became something special. Back when the cast was asked about the show's rough start, Aziz Ansari made this connection between their show's first season and Seinfeld's first season. That first season where it sort of had a, a tepid response from viewers, it feels like the second season is where the show really came into its own. Did all of you guys get a sense of that, that something was sort of like clicking here by season two? Like any show like, the, especially like comedy shows, the, the first few episodes, it, it's usually kind of figuring out, like you watch like the first few episodes of Seinfeld, it's way different than what, what it became. I think it's just a matter of like figuring out the characters and figuring out what the, what, what the show is, you know? And the comparison is fair. Just like Parks and Recreation, Seinfeld's first season had some issues that almost got it canceled by the network. But what were those issues? How did the creators fix them? And what was the first perfect episode where the Seinfeld we all know and love was truly born? This video is sponsored by FlexiSpot. I remember reading an article about eight years ago that said sitting is the new smoking. Sitting all day is linked to so many health problems like an increased chance of weight gain, back pain, anxiety and depression, diabetes, heart disease, and even cancer. That was about eight years ago when I read that, but I still proceeded to sit at my desk for eight hours a day while working. A few months ago, I sprained my back just bending over to pick up my kid. I finally decided that I needed to do something better to help my back and my overall health, and thanks to FlexiSpot, I finally have a beautiful standing desk. They sent me the Komar Electric Standing Desk EW8, and it's exactly what I needed. It has a 48-inch bamboo top, a drawer, USB ports, and a motor with programmable settings that honestly goes higher than I expected. I mean, I'm 6'5", and I don't even put the desk up to its max height. I put the entire desk together by myself in about 15 minutes, and I've been loving finally getting to stand up when I work on these videos. If you've been thinking about getting a standing desk, you really need to go check out FlexiSpot. Check the link in my description below. It'll take you to their website. You can check out everything they have to offer, and I guarantee that you won't be disappointed. These desks are beautiful, they're affordable, so there are no more excuses. Again, make sure you use the link in my description. That way you won't just get a perfect standing desk for yourself, but you'll also help my channel at the same time. Thanks again to FlexiSpot for sponsoring this video. And now let's get back to the essay. I'm Stu Chermak. I'm from NBC. Oh. Uh, could we speak for a few moments? Sure, sure. Hi, Jay Crespi. Hello. Seinfeld has one of the most famous and increasingly mythical origin stories. But the general story goes something like this. For years, Jerry Seinfeld had been a successful stand-up comedian and popular guest on NBC's The Tonight Show. The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson launched many successful careers, with many comedians landing on TV shows, or even having their own TV show like Andy Kaufman, Robin Williams, Ellen DeGeneres, Roseanne Barr, Drew Carey. But Seinfeld had to wait, as he tells it, nine years before executives at NBC figured out that they should probably think about giving Seinfeld a show. I had been on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson for nine years. Did nobody we... at NBC, nobody. Why don't we talk to this kid? Nine years of killing on The Carson Show should have triggered something in there. Something, them. nothing. I come in for the meeting, they go, do you have anything you would like to do if you ever did a show for us? I said, not really. Talking with Larry David at the Improv, I tell him the story. We start talking, and then we go across the street to a uh, Korean deli. We're making fun of everything in the deli. I wanted salsa, not salsa! Don't you know the difference between salsa and salsa? <laughs> you have the salsa after the salsa. He goes, this is what the show should be. <laughs> this should be the show. This is the show. <laughs> what? Yes. Just talk. <laughs> yeah, right. Two comedians just making fun of stuff as they walk around during the day. Yeah, and that was it. That's where the idea for the show was born. Two stupid guys commenting on and making fun of everything while seemingly talking about, well, nothing. The pilot episode debuted on July 5th, 1989, under the name The Seinfeld Chronicles. 
There's a couple mainstay elements there from the beginning, like the random and tedious conversation topics, and Seinfeld stand-up routines that offer other angles on the episode's main topic. But the pilot episode as a whole really feels like a shadow of what was to come. Instead of the iconic music, there was more of this typical cheesy 80s sitcom music. Get the cash, get your friends the car, the spot, the reservation. Then you stand around, what do you do? You go, we gotta be getting back. There's Jerry, George, and Kramer, but in the pilot episode, Jerry is more of the neurotic character, with George acting more suave and savvy as he continually imparts wisdom. She calls you today, she doesn't make a plan for tomorrow? What is that? It's Saturday night. Yeah. What is that? It's ridiculous. And Kramer isn't even Kramer, he's Kessler, and written as a shut-in who never leaves the apartment. Boy, the Mets blew it tonight, huh? Oh, what are you doing? Kessler, it's a tape. Elaine doesn't exist in the pilot episode. Instead, there was Claire. Decaf left, regular right. Very challenging work. <laughs> the coffee shop waitress who worked at Pete's Luncheonette, a set left over from the Muppets Take Manhattan. Uh, excuse me, Pete. What is? Uh, well, I thought maybe you might have some work here I could help you out with. Even though it would air in a different order, the next episode produced was Male Unbonding, and it immediately felt more like the Seinfeld we all know and love. It had the right music, the sets looked more accurate, with Pete's Luncheonette becoming Monk's Cafe, George felt more neurotic, Kessler became Kramer with his usual crazy business ideas, and most importantly was the addition of Elaine. Okay, so we make the first episode. I don't think anybody liked it that much. Okay, you can make a few more, but you need a real female character. All you've got is three stupid guys. When the network tells you what they think you should do, it is called a network note. Julia Louis-Dreyfus, who agreed to do this part, with three stupid guys, this person is a network note. And unlike 99% of studio notes, this one was actually a great idea. She was added mid-production, which is why she randomly shows up at the end of the episode in only one scene. Come on, let's go do something. I don't want to just sit around here. Okay. Want to go get something to eat? Where do you want to go? I don't care, I'm not hungry. It almost felt like the creators didn't really know how to include or explain her character. In the next episode, The Stakeout, Elaine is now fully immersed into the show, with the majority of the episode giving context to her and Jerry's prior relationship. Pamela, do I know her? Yeah, you met her when we were going out. Oh yeah, right. Have you totally blocked out the entire time we were a couple? And making sure that the episode's ending squashed any potential will-they-won't-they they storylines in the future. I mean, obviously we have a little problem here. Yeah, obviously. I mean, if we're gonna be friends, we gotta be able to talk about other people. Couldn't agree more. The first season of only five episodes was rough, but the show's unique voice and mantra of no hugging, no learning was clear from the start. In the history of pilot reports, Seinfeld has got to be one of the worst of all time. I have it next to my desk. It says, overall evaluation, weak. The audience did not like the show, and that scared us. But we did manage to find money to film four episodes to hold the show intact by making one less two-hour Bob Hope special. And it did okay. It was against repeat competition in the summer, and then we just took a deep breath and ordered 12 more. The second season aired in 1991, with some much-needed changes. All the characters were now having their own storylines, which was a welcome change for Elaine, who never had her own storyline in the first season and never appeared in a scene by herself without Jerry present. Episodes like The Bus Boy started to highlight a staple of classic Seinfeld episodes where multiple storylines dovetailed, colliding at the end in this really satisfying way. Get your hands off me! You go to hell! Me I can't talk about it! <laughs> And it was in season two where Seinfeld really garnered its reputation as the show about nothing, especially in the episode The Chinese Restaurant, the day Seinfeld was born. I remember the exact restaurant I was in with Larry, and uh, we were waiting for a table, and I remember him writing the idea down. I thought this, this could be a pretty funny idea. Waiting in real time. You get 23 minutes to do the show, whatever, let's... Let's just have them wait 23 minutes for a table. The premise for the episode is deceptively simple. Jerry, George, and Elaine wait for a table at a Chinese restaurant. Oh, it'll be five, 10 minutes. 
Masterfully set in real time, the episode takes on the qualities of this existential stage play. Nothing happens, but at the same time, so much is happening in this little space that reveals the realities and absurdity of everyday life and human behavior. Notably absent from the episode is Kramer. When I wasn't in the Chinese restaurant episode, I, I felt hurt. The reason why the character isn't in the Chinese restaurant episode is because that was part of the character. He didn't go out with them. If that episode had been written a year or two later, he would have been there. The Chinese uh, restaurant episode was so unique that I, I just wanted to be a part of that uniqueness because it was cutting edge. I knew that was a very important episode. So odd. It was a vision that the executives at NBC did not share. Uh, am I am I missing am I missing pages? Are, we, are they trying to save money? I I, I was I, I didn't get it. I read that script and I went. Nothing happens. Which again, isn't true. Jerry, George, and Elaine all have little individual plot lines to track throughout. Jerry feels guilty. He pretended to be sick in order to get out of dinner at his uncle's house. I told my uncle I had a stomachache tonight. You think he bought that? While at the restaurant, he recognizes a woman he can't quite place, who turns out to be someone who works at his uncle's office, most likely blowing his alibi. I am in big, big trouble. <gasps> The one you broke the plans with tonight? Yeah, she works in his office. George is trying to save face with a woman he abandoned the night before during sex because, as he put it, And I begin to perceive this impending intestinal requirement. <laughs> too embarrassing for the bathroom in her tiny apartment with no buffer zone. He tries to invite her to join them, but keeps losing the one payphone to other rude customers. You know, we're living in a society. <laughs> we're supposed to act in a civilized way. And when he is finally able to leave a message for her, she calls back, but the host incorrectly calls out for Cartwright. He yelled Cartwright. <laughs> I missed that. You're not Cartwright. Of course I'm not Cartwright! <laughs> and finally, Elaine is starving and continues to get hungrier and hungrier. She's dared to steal a customer's egg roll, but chickens out. What did she say? Come on, tell me what she said. What did she say? And then attempts to bribe the host for a table, which also fails miserably. Uh, Denison for? To try and appease the network that was insistent that the episode lacked any normal story stakes or beats, the writers added a ticking clock device to add pressure on the characters. And eventually we put in the clock, so we decided they were gonna, they were gonna head out to a movie, and it was Plan Night from Outer Space, was only playing one night, and it put some pressure and some, it ratcheted up the stakes. They're all trying to grab a quick bite before seeing a one night only showing of Plan 9 from Outer Space, a 1959 sci-fi film which has grown its own cult following over the decades after earning the reputation as one of the worst films ever made. This isn't plans one through eight from outer space. This is plan nine. This is the one that worked. The worst movie ever made. But according to Larry David, once the final episode was handed in, they still hated it and did not want to air it, but eventually relented and dumped it near the end of the season once they were sure that the show would be canceled anyways. But of course, the opposite happened. In Larry's words, it became one of the episodes that put the show into another category. To me, it was the defining beginning of the, the anarchy of Seinfeld, and it was, it was a great episode. Unlike dramas or even other sitcoms, you can't trace Seinfeld by way of its character arcs. Again, no hugging, no learning. Instead, it was about the logic, structure, and form of the show itself. The writers were more focused on what not to do and how to play with expectations of what a sitcom could be. As Jerry Seinfeld put it in 1991, in describing how he works with potential writers on the show, I tell them we don't want sitcom ideas. I tell them what we don't want to do, but it's hard to explain what we do want. What the episode proved was that the characters themselves, their interactions with one another, and the raw comedy they could extract from any situation was the backbone of the show, and quite frankly, more than enough. Seinfeld seems to be at its greatest when its own creators back themselves up against the wall. When they take the smallest premise, or joke, 
or problem and see what they can mine from it. In this episode, that is all exacerbated by the small, singular space that the characters find themselves in, the lobby of this Chinese restaurant. It's as if the creators were saying to the executives and the audience, if we can do all this within a single space, just wait until you really get behind us and let us do our thing. The episode went on to inspire other bizarre episodes and plot lines that Seinfeld would become known for. Episodes that played with structure and locations, bottle episodes, episodes told in reverse. Another episode considered to be one of the series best is the third season episode, The Parking Garage, where the group spends the entire episode trying to find Kramer's car in a parking garage. Think we'll hit traffic? Of course we'll hit traffic, it's rush hour. Isn't it going the other way? There's no other way in New York. Everybody goes every way all the time. The parking garage, though, does not take place in real time, and the group's movement throughout the space gives it a decidedly different feel. They end on different notes, too. The Chinese restaurant ends with the trio leaving and the host finally announcing that their table is ready just as the door closes behind them. Seinfeld! Four! They never reach their goal of the table, and perhaps if they stayed, they never would. In contrast, the gang does find Kramer's car, but the catch is it won't start. A resolution that has far less absurd and abstract ending than the Chinese restaurant, but one in which the main characters still lose in the end. The impact of the Chinese restaurant episode cannot be overstated. It proved the artistic visions of Larry and Jerry, proved the NBC executives wrong, or maybe it proved them right for sticking with it as long as they did, and proved to audiences that this was a show where they could expect things that they had never seen on TV before. But perhaps the greatest impact was on the cast, in setting the tone for the show they were making. We table read the episode called The Chinese Restaurant, in which nothing happens. And, and that was the first time, honestly, where I remember thinking, this show may not last. <laughs> but that wasn't the important thing for them. They had voices, they had craft, they had integrity, and they could only do the show that they could do. They weren't going to do someone else's show. They were going to write what they knew and what they believed in and either soar or sink on their own petard. And I was so suddenly proud to be a part of that effort. Just talking? Well, what's the show about? It's about nothing. You gotta have a story. Who says you gotta have a story? Remember when we were waiting for, for that table in that Chinese restaurant that time? That could be a TV show. Hi everyone, thanks so much for watching this essay. When I first started doing the Day X Was Born series, Seinfeld was the one you guys kept asking for and asking for, so I really hope you guys enjoyed it. If you did, please like it and share it with a friend, but also leave me a comment below. Tell me, what episode do you think is the first perfect episode of Seinfeld? The one that really nails what the show would eventually become. If you're not already, make sure you're subscribed to the channel, but also make sure you click the bell below, so that way you're notified whenever a new Entertain the Elk video drops. Otherwise, who knows if YouTube will even share it with you, and I'd hate for you to miss any new video that I put out. Again, if you're looking for a standing desk, please again go check out the link below in the description. FlexiSpot makes incredible tables, and I know that you'll enjoy it. And again, you'll help my channel at the same time. Thanks again everyone for watching, and I will see you all in the next video.